Hi, I'm Kofi Opoku Ansa. And I'm Daniel Mark Miller. Welcome to the VFX Artists Podcast. The podcast by artists for artists with informative and inspirational interviews to help you raise your game and inspire the next generation of artists. Hey, this time we're both together. Uh, so welcome yeah. to the... Actually, yeah. You should say it. Let's start. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the VFX Artists Podcast. Um, yeah. It's good to finally yeah. be together on the podcast. This is a, yeah. uh, a new one. Yeah. I feel like I'm I'm going to be interrogated today. I feel like I'm on, I'm, I'm in the hot seat today. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, am I the host and you're the guest? It week, feels like it? yeah, it feels like I'm going to be interrogated, but <laughs> That wasn't yeah. the plan, but yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> no, I I mean I guess so this is our end of year summary. It's been a really exciting year. I mean, obviously you started the podcast um in May. Uh, Feb- yeah, uh, well, yeah. No, actually in February, I had the idea, and then March, the first episode dropped. You went off with a bang, right? Like, starting with Ace Ace Rule, which is... Yeah. Uh, you know, he's, he's a character. I mean, he's he's really amazing. So, yeah. tell us a bit about that. Yeah. Please. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Ace's episode was really cool, because um, before I started the, the podcast, I, I had been coming across Ace's um linkedin posts through my connections so for those that don't know like who is ace and what does he do because yeah oh okay so ace is um a motion capture artist um he's a i mean he's got he's got a few titles so he 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 calls himself a performance um actor or motion capture artist and and he he works a, a lot of the time for games and um especially um films so he does a lot of the motion capture for for films um and he's 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 built he's built a reputation on set for for his um he's well known for doing creep creature um motion capture so he's got these uh cool um what do you call he's it? He's got the arm extensions and the leg and extensions and the, t- and the bionic yeah. tails and this crazy stuff. Um, yeah. It's, it's nuts. Yeah. And he, he, he was just on Internals as well, you know. Like the movie just came out. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, yeah. I he's realized, doing some big yeah. Stuff and, and he's doing some other big stuff. That, yeah. And I, I actually met him at the BFX and I'd met him before at a rain dance yeah. event. So he, he did his presentation with his arms. Because when I saw the arm extension, I thought it was like a pair of crutches. I was like, why are you carrying? Why have you got uh, those? What are they? Yeah. <laughs> and he, when he told his story, it just blew everyone <laughs> away. Um, oh, yeah. But he's, yeah, he's been doing these classes. And so, yeah. So that's a great. So let's um, hear a bit of, a bit of that episode. Many special effects or or practical effects company, they will get the budget for the project to make something. Whereas I make all of these ready and they're ready to go. And I also run classes on my stuff. So right now we're in our third class on creature arm extension class where I take 12 actors, movement performers, and they all get a pair of arm extension each and they learn how to move quadrupeds. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's a, there's a big long, vision of where we're going and so far we are in the right direction how a normal day starts depending on what you're doing because then you've got there's two types of really ways of mocap is like you know there's kind of three so there's like you do gameplay so you know do the stuff that the player is doing in the game Mm -hmm. then you have locomotion so locomotion is when you're doing all the movements so you know when you're when you're on a control pad and you press left Mm -hmm. they turn left right you hold r2 they lift their arm up so you've got to do all of the locomotion as well. And then you've got scene work. So if you know if you're doing a scene, you know, like cutscenes in a game, mm-hmm. and you, you have to do that. So depending on what you have to do, you normally go to a studio. I say start time could be around nine. It's like a normal night, it's like nine to five. Right. So nine to five, go to a studio, you get your you get your outfit on, get marked up, you do a couple of movements in the in the volume to make sure the system's working with your with your movement then you get to to the work that you're doing. So mm-hmm. whether it's a scene, whether yeah. it's locomotion, if you ask me what the most toughest, the toughest days in mocap is when you're going to do locomotion for different characters and it's only you in the studio. So <laughs> meaning there's no other actor. It's mm-hmm. you doing 
all of these different movements so mm-hmm. like and and there's no break there's only lunch right. there's yeah. no take 10 minutes because there's a list of moves that we got to get through we got to get do all these punches we got to do all these kicks mm-hmm. we got to do these runs we got to do these deaths we got to do these turns we got to do yeah. the interactions we got to do all of these things the best thing that i can say really is is to work from the notion of thinking about how can i get them to come to me that's how i think i think about you know i'm the asset how can i i'm the asset i need to invest in myself to a point where they look at me and want to invest in me because that's what typically was happening when they put money in you they're investing in you to make Mm -hmm. their project great so i look at it from the point of view of of how can i instead of me emailing them me you know, please, hi, I do this. How about mm-hmm. I create stuff that make them look at me and be like, oh, we want to work with him. Oh, yeah. we want to work with him. You know, so it's like, even like us having this podcast, I must have been doing something that made you said, oh, I want to interview of him course. rather than me yeah. come to you and be like, hey, can you, can you put me in your podcast? Mm-hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. I operate yeah. from that. So I say to people, you have to know exactly what it, want, what it is you want to do. What's the purpose behind it and the why. Mm-hmm. And then, when you find out the why and you know what it is you want to do, you work mm-hmm. from the mindset of them. I need to invest in myself. I'm the asset. So I need to find ways for them to see me and be like, you know what? We want to work with him. So that hopefully that will get people excited. If you haven't seen the episode, definitely check it out. It's uh, I think that was, that mm-hmm. was the first episode you released. So that was pretty cool. That was the first episode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we got, we got following up with Gerando Raffin, Arneson, so that's a pretty yeah. cool and a helicopter. So we got a dude on a helicopter flying around, filming <laughs> volcanoes for Game of Thrones, just to give people an idea of the level that that you started this thing with. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So um, Yuri, he yeah, he said, or well, he told me his his friends call him Yuri as a as a nickname, so it's easier for people to recognize. But yeah, I f- yeah came across yuri on instagram for some reason he he added me like soon i think soon before i i started the podcast um as i haven't actually asked him why or how he found me but 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 anyway he added me and then um soon as i had the idea to start the podcast i reached out to him um to want to interview him because i saw what he did he was like he's a vfx supervisor and um and yeah he lives in Iceland and he he supervised some some um seasons and episodes for Game of Thrones um and although um unfortunately I haven't actually watched any of um Game of Thrones I shouldn't say but I've not seen it I've just <laughs> I've seen trailers and I've heard a lot about it but Game of Thrones is quite a big um yeah show and i think everyone knows about it so i was quite interested and keen to to find out what his role was yeah. on the show so i reached out to him and then yeah we we set a date and then yeah we, in fairness yeah, to you it's very it hard to watch if you have kids around like you've got to wait till kids are in bed or asleep and you haven't got other things yeah. to do it's it's definitely yeah. not when you can sit with your kids and watch <laughs> but, no definitely not <laughs> I, I, I think i only got through like season one and for the same reason i just like had to wait till my kids were in bed and then put the blu-rays on yeah but uh yeah so let's and he's got five yeah. kids actually to bring kids <laughs> yeah i don't know how he does it i don't know how he do, how he does it because he 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 must be away a lot most of the time and yeah i don't know he how does he talk does about it. that I mean, in the episode he, though i mean yeah, I mean, yeah, he explained. That, yeah, he <laughs> he did advise me that yeah, it's all about yeah communication and I th- and I think his big thing was yeah, understand. He was like, when he's there, he's there because he's not working. Like he's yeah. got these, he disappears, yeah. does his stuff, and then comes back. And yeah, he doesn't do it. You know, he's at home all the time. So. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's yeah. a bit different to being an artist in a studio, so it's, it's slightly different setup, but. It's, yeah, definitely. So let's hear hear a bit yeah. of that. So what they did there, they shot this the scene in a in an Irish uh, old abandoned uh, quarry, mm-hmm. like a mining quarry. Yeah. And dressed that, and then they got my digital assets, which was all these really unique uh, cliff uh, rock formations. Mm-hmm. 
and they basically kind of maybe use them as Legos to dress the scene okay. with those uh, assets, you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So that that was kind of uh, that was kind of um, the foundation of a workflow that mm -hmm. turned out to be very successful yeah. through yeah. through the scenes. Yeah, and then in season eight we kind of stepped it up another gear, you yeah. know. And yeah. I, that's when I made made my my by far my biggest captures, you know, and oh, yeah, also the most most crazy mm -hmm. uh, plates. Yeah, uh, I've shot so far, you know. Yeah, of course. Are are yeah. you always capturing on from the helicopter or do you tend to do very some... much yes right. i mean mm -hmm. i do do drones as well mm -hmm. but you know very often and this is i've got got at least uh, one job coming up now that's mm -hmm. the same kind of thing that yeah we start making we start planning both out you know and mm -hmm. we start calculating both and because um with a drone in Iceland, you the locations are often very remote, very difficult mm -hmm. to get to. Yeah. So that means that if you're going with a drone approach, mm -hmm. then you need super jeeps, which are very expensive to rent. Yeah. And then it's gonna take days. Yeah. Whereas if you jump in a helicopter, you mm -hmm. can get it all done in one day. Yeah. You don't need any of these super jeeps, no hotel, yeah. no food, no mm -hmm. extra days work on me and so on. Mm -hmm. So it more often than not turns out to be uh, cost effective to use yeah. the helicopter. Rolling, taking it back a bit, um, mm. you came up with the idea for the podcast. How did that? How did that happen? How did you? Yeah, yeah, crazy story. It's it's quite funny, but um, I was saying to <laughs> I was saying to a few people, my my three year old woke up one early morning in february like it was around two or three a.m and he's very like into cars and like when he sleeps he like, he has to hold one so he like he sleeps holding his toy cars and <laughs> he woke up and he was very excited and he wanted to play and like in in at like, 3 a.m in the morning and then and then i couldn't go back to sleep so i just sat there just my mind was just going churning and then i figured i, I realized that I had so many industry contacts on my LinkedIn. Um, and I was thinking back about my college days and my university days, just because I realized when I was at university, I, I, I had no idea about the VFX industry. And um, how I came about learning about the VFX, VFX industry was through an industry day that we had at university on my second year, um, which changed everything. Because prior to knowing about VFX, I was looking to working in, in the animation and the video games industry. But then when I learned about VFX through the studios that attended the industry day, it changed my career path, which led me into working into, into, in VFX. So I realized I had so many industry contacts through years of working in industry as well as freelancing. And I thought, oh, it would be quite cool to just, yeah, invite people on, on the podcast and just have them share their journey into the industry just so that I could inspire someone someone that might be looking to get into the industry or someone that might already be in the industry but might be thinking of changing switching departments for example so yeah that's how it came about cool no I mean and yeah. it's interesting you say that because I mean it's not just I, I had the same well, one my son always also used to sleep with a car yeah. And funnily enough, I, <laughs> I, my wife always would always drive, and so whenever my wife wasn't around, like she was working in the hospital at night yeah. or something, she, she, he'd like have a car, and whenever I was away, because my first job was like in Milan and we were living in Rome, and uh, okay. he would take a train instead, because I, <laughs> I was always like, on, or a bus, because he associated me with buses yeah. and trains and mum with of uh, course, yeah. cars. Oh, wow. But, <laughs> That aside, like, I know exactly what you mean. I had no idea about this whole VFX, VFX thing. And I think all of the stuff that's out there now and VFX podcast, artist podcast is part of that, mm -hmm. uh, I think is really is really a big help to people. If you're just not sure what mm -hmm. you want to do, you can actually listen to someone that's doing what you might want to do and yeah. hear if that's a thing that you'd be interested in. And you can hear a couple of different yeah. artists with different perspectives from different backgrounds. Yeah. Um, and and even if you're in the industry, like there are bits of the industry you just don't know exist, right? Like I mean, like yeah. I mean, obviously we have the Aces example, but I mean, you know, moving on, you know, 
even for example some of the AR and XR stuff that you, mm -hmm. you talk about later yeah. um, or the fact that there are people doing you know um, the differences between previous and post vis and then of course you've got mm -hmm. people that are doing independent film or doing you know doing stuff in, in that way so I mean I think it's yeah. quite a wide range of things that you know you might know about your yeah. bit of the industry but you don't know about others and you might at some point become interested in something else or want to widen your yeah. horizons or move move across to something else so i think it's, it's yeah. a resource not just for um people outside the industry but people inside as well just to hear different people's perspective mm -hmm. different people's perspective or even if you're very senior you just want to hear like what it's like now yeah to be a junior or to be yeah, a mid exactly. or senior, you know yeah I mean, <laughs> yeah yeah what's definitely, life yeah. like down there <laughs> yeah definitely yeah yeah, I think yeah, it's definitely the curiosity that makes the episodes so diverse and yeah, topical. Cool. Yeah. So moving on to the next, so we've we've had this uh, quite a cool one uh, with Vladimir Benkov. So yeah, we've got a character modeler, which is something it's really competitive. Everyone wants to be a character mm. modeler. I mean, everyone that's three D, especially yeah. you know, it's like and uh, yeah. So tell us a bit about this one. Yeah, so yeah, Vladimir, I, I worked with Vladimir at Glassworks in 20, between 20, 2011 and 2013. He was a freelancer and I was a junior working at Glassworks. Um, so Glassworks predominantly worked for um, post-production for commercials. But yeah, Vladimir was always brought into Glassworks just, just for his talent. He, he was always reliable and he's very good at character modeling and um yeah he is a really cool guy as well and um i'd always was inspired well i found his 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 work to be really inspiring because as a junior when when you see um seniors that do amazing work you literally you're like blown away you just you, you can't contemplate how good people are <laughs> so, and there's so, always someone uh, like that right there's always something that even when you get more senior then it just does something you're yeah like, what? <laughs> yeah i just yeah it's like how yeah so yeah vladimir yeah i, I chose to brought vladimir on just because he's he's really cool and i wanted to find out about his his journey um i mean on the outside he's he's quite reserved and so i was very curious to find out more about how he got into the industry and how he started and yeah it was quite interesting how how he did it but yeah cool. um yeah, since since then, actually, since Vladimir, I've I've noticed since twenty twenty thirteen, I've noticed that the level of 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 character modeling artists have so dramatically improved so much that how realistically how models are being made these days are so superior, and it's just the the level of detail that people go into is just mind blowing. I just sometimes I just I just I just wonder why you can't just take a photo of 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 a real person instead of just like spending those <laughs> hours just carving and and sculpting all those those wrinkles and but it's just it's yeah like it's painting, I guess incredible. You know, it's, it, there's a, there's an element of an art form in itself and of course then you've got in the mm. industry you've got creatures that don't exist and you've got doubles mm. that are doing dangerous things that you really can't yeah. do or you probably shouldn't do. <laughs> for yeah. safety reasons. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, but let's hear a bit. Of, let's hear a bit yeah. of uh, Vladimir. The main thing is my my curiosity mm -hmm. about nature and, and about forms and shapes. Mm -hmm. um, I love I love I love everything organic. Anything organic, yeah. trees, mm -hmm. animals. Uh, yeah. uh, people uh, uh types of bodies and everything mm -hmm. that's that's uh, these things they 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 made me the 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 person i am basically yeah sure of course i love i love uh i love alive things basically if it's a creature i can do some sketches i can mm -hmm. find photos on the internet i can do some sketches just to mm -hmm. to get familiarized with with the features of the creature mm -hmm. and then um the, the the software of my choice is zbrush okay. i used to do mud box as well right so now we've got like a real change of pace because you've gone from like modeling 
uh, mm-hmm. to an actor and a stunt performer. So yeah. David Cheng, this is this is actually quite a, you know. So it's not just although it's a VFX artist podcast, <laughs> yeah. cheating a little bit because every now and again there's someone that's not quite. Yeah. Exercise. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, so I was quite interested in in finding about stunts um, performance. I mean, I, they're not technically in the VFX industry, but they are part of 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 the chain i guess because yeah. because because they 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 are quite relevant in 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 movies and and it's not true yeah they, they're they definitely like there's a there's a connection between what they do and vfx even if it's yeah. like rig removal at the most basic level yeah you know, before you had like the the you know the ability to paint out wires they had to use mm-hmm. really thin wires and and, uh, and yeah. hide them in the set which mm-hmm. changed their whole way of working now you can put a massive crane there and no one cares yeah just remove it afterwards so I guess there's, there's this big connection of not just that we work on them, but that mm-hmm. their work is changed by by what we yeah. do, right? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it was just my curiosity, um, yeah, brought me to bring David on. And I was, I was quite interested in, in finding out how they, like their life as, as stunt actors, because it's, it's a long day being on set and, it's it's quite ta- ta- um, taxing as a stunt um, actor performance actor. So I was I was keen to find out how what they go through and how they deal with with those long hours and yeah, what, especially yeah. when it's like the next like it's not just you're tired, it's you're tired. Can you jump off this ledge? <laughs> 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 yeah. Can you yeah. kick this person again? Or yeah, whatever, or you know? be set on fire. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let's hear, let's hear David. I always did martial arts because my granddad was a martial arts instructor. Yeah. So um, he'll be teaching his students in the back garden and I'll be like jumping in and copying and yeah. getting taught the same moves and learning forms and um, gradually started uh, like sparring for students as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah who are my friends now as well, um, like lifelong friends. So we were learning martial arts from a really young age. Yeah. And then in 2017, um, yeah. was it? No, not 2007, it was 2007. Mm-hmm. I met a Shaolin monk. So I started learning like Shaolin Kung Fu and a lot of different weapon forms from him. Yeah. So I trained for about three years with him and then started competing. Um, in 2010 and then in 2011 that's when I was cast in a Hollywood movie called 47 Ronin with Keanu Reeves Mm -hmm. so that's when like I had my first foot into like the film industry yeah Um, and that's what changed everything really we're changing pace again we're looking at Lila's photogrammetry this is um Joseph Steele so yeah yeah, this is something different so visual skies what's that what's that all about yeah, Joe, Joe, uh, Joe, and I went to university and we did the same animation course. But he, he, after graduating, he he stood on, he stayed on to do masters, um, and he he chose a different topic to focus on. But then he eventually, through his interest and um, like his love for dr- working with drones, he built his own drones and um, yeah, he started his his company um, called Visual Sky. He built his own drones. Yeah, when he started off, he was building his his own drones in in his kitchen, and he was he was doing the coding as well for it, and testing them, um, and then yeah, that's how it started, and he he yeah he started his company, and so I wanted to find out how um, he built his company and 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 got his clients such as Disney and 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 working with like Netflix and all of these big studios, which was quite impressive for for. To be able to go in into such a big industry and then build such incredible clients it was quite impressive so yeah. i wanted to find out yeah how he did it and and what the drones have to do with what he does um so, yeah so, yeah so let's check that out and then obviously yeah. if you if you want to find out how he did it you need to listen to the whole thing but let's yeah. check out a little bit of that now We've worked on uh, Disney films like Artemis Fowl, where we provided uh, landscape scanning and aerial filming services. 
So that what that involves is scanning uh, large landscapes with drones, lidar, and photogrammetry, yeah. and then recreating those landscapes in three D mm -hmm. um, using a process called photogrammetry. So this is this is an interesting one because you're talking next with um, Sarah yeah. Gatefield, who basically yeah. works in the same department as you. So yeah, uh, does that mean you can get a little bit deeper since you know you're yeah. kind of doing the same thing? Yeah, my yeah my yeah definitely yeah, my move was. It was fun. It was a fun episode, and it was it was maybe I guess easy for for <laughs> for me to 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 discuss. But it was quite interesting because Sarah is um she she's been she was a yeah she's a supervisor and she's been through the whole journey that I I've been on um and so I wanted to find out more about yeah how her journey and 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 what she's doing um. But then also she was interesting is that she, apart from being a match move supervisor, she she was quite interested in in, in venturing into the um, AR and VR um, industry, and she wanted to to try and find out more about it. So she she was the first. I think she was the first guest that had tried to switch departments in a way, mm. um, not fully, but she yeah she tried to. St stay away from much move and focus on something else that she found very interested in tr interesting in um so yeah it was really cool in, um, it, um episode i think um but yeah the, also <laughs> through that episode I, yeah i was i was keen on finding out about because as a much move artist in the past I've, i i realized that much move wasn't sort of respected in a way as a as a as a um, what do you call it as a pub exactly yeah because they're a senior match move artist and they're very important because if it mm -hmm. doesn't match move it doesn't if it doesn't match everything's a nightmare but then yeah. many many see it as like a junior role that you then move on but mm -hmm. there are also like yourself people that move upwards within match yeah. move right and become yeah. senior match move artists so yeah, that's that's the that's a challenge, I guess, to make people realise that no, I'm not like I've, I've not just started. I don't want to be an animator. <laughs> yeah. I'm like a senior match move artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, as a as a as a compositor yourself, what 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 do you think about the help that you get from match move artists? Well, Cause, like cause... literally, if it doesn't work in match move, it, it's a, it's a nightmare. Like, yeah. <laughs> like everything is <laughs> everything is messed up. Like, yeah. I mean, I've. I've, I've worked on a few shows where, you know, we've had problems with match move and especially, you know, they're challenging shots. It's not mm -hmm. like they're, sometimes they've been bad, just bad, but mm -hmm. most of the time it's been, they've just been very difficult shots, pull focuses, like sort of yeah. Bayhem type things that go round and round and round, mm -hmm. body tracks with, you know, very cl close interaction and not a yeah. lot of room to hide, mirrors, I don't know how you guys deal with mirrors because mirrors just oh, yeah. fucking one up. I mean, I, we shouldn't swear on this podcast, but mirrors. <laughs> like, yeah, mir mirrors, mirrors, and smoke, yeah, and dust. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm interested that at some point all the match move software really needs to actually come up with a better solution for mirrors in a way of solving reflections in a better way. Because at the yeah. moment, it seems like it's either you're relying on the renderer to render the reflections based on where the the actual mirror is or mm -hmm. you're you know you're creating another camera on the opposite axis and that yeah. that seems like a bit of a hack really like yeah, it just it is, seems yeah. like there should be a better way of doing this yeah you should be able to put in it that's a mirror and then have it yeah. solve the mirror exactly yeah as it solves the camera yeah and if you're listening and you work for a company that makes <laughs> 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 software then please do this <laughs> yeah. get on it now <laughs> yeah but apart from that, she also, so she's a developer, so that if you're interested in development and um, VR and XR, then mm -hmm. this episode is, is for you. So let's hear yeah. um, a bit of Sarah Gatefield. It depends on the project, because mm -hmm. I've also done some projects for, uh, like with Snapchat, for okay. example, um, and I've made some filters for uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, and Zappa, for example. Mm -hmm. So it could be, this is the thing that I like about Match Move as well, though. Every day could be different. 
right? Yeah. So if it's match move, then you might be getting camera information or you might be just putting points down or you might be throwing the scenes together and then passing it along to the mm. next person in the pipeline. Yeah. With VR and AR, you could be working with the 2D artists in order to get the UX and the UI correct. And there's a lot of problem solving there as well because when you, you don't realize that when you use a mobile application, um, how much thought has gone into that. And now there are certain industry standards where we know that the button that goes next should be on the right, right? Mm -hmm. And the button to go back should be on yeah. the left. But that took some time to kind of figure out. And mm -hmm. it's the same in like virtual reality. Where's gonna be best to put an interactive button that tells you to go forward? Mm -hmm. And because in virtual reality, you can do things in 3D space, we shouldn't just be thinking about these 2D buttons. We should be making it more exciting because yeah. in virtual reality, you can do anything. So imagine it could be a giant strawberry that is in front of you. Yeah. And for that, you need to push it or you need to hit it or something. Mm -hmm. um, it, I guess I'm trying to say that like every day could be different and it could be creative or it could be technical. It yeah. Could be a mix of these things. For me as an entry level uh, artist, when I was a runner, my options were paint and roto to go mm -hmm. down the comp side or mm -hmm. to do match move to then probably go into lighting or modeling or one of those other things. Mm -hmm. But I also know people that have been match move artists or supervisors or whatever for a number of years, like mm -hmm. myself. Yeah. Because as you said, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. like everybody needs a camera, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get anything done without a camera and you mm -hmm. will notice when the camera doesn't work, yeah. right? It always comes back to us to, to yeah. sort out. Um, I think it's because maybe people don't realize the amount of work that goes into it. They think, mm -hmm. and especially with virtual production, I think people get this idea that, oh, the camera's been tracked, so therefore you can just throw it into my own, it's done. Mm -hmm. And actually, no. Like there's still a lot of offsets, there's still mm -hmm. a lot of counter animation that you might need to do mm -hmm. because although it might have picked it up at the time, like there will be interference, there will be this extra mm -hmm. jitter, yeah. right? And and our job as a match move artist is to recreate that. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to kind of have a depth awareness. You need to understand where to put those points. Mm -hmm. um, and even in a layout way, like, that is a little bit more creative. You're, yeah. you're doing that from scratch rather than picking points. Um, but you kind of also need to understand what the director wants, right? It's not just yeah. a case of like, it goes from here to here. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, I don't know why there's still that yeah. there, but I wish there wasn't. And people yeah. can make a career out of it if they want. But I also think it's important that they stick, uh, they, they keep learning mm -hmm. new technologies because okay, yeah. that's all good we come together. My first film credit, well, the first two film credits were a couple of shots for Harry Potter, mm -hmm. uh, number seven, part two. Right. And I was a big Harry Potter fan. Oh, so yeah, wow. Just to get yeah. a couple of shots on there, it was, yeah. it was really nice. Yeah. Um, and also, as a child, <laughs> I was obsessed with horses, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. But later I found out that I was allergic to horses. Right. <laughs> So I could never do horse riding lessons. Yeah. Yet. But I read lots of books and um, there's a writer called uh, Michael Morpugo and he mm -hmm. does, he always writes about animals. And one of mm -hmm. his books that stuck with me was called War Horse. Okay, yeah. And it's about this horse that, that goes through, I think it's the First World War and he ends up losing his owner and then later he <laughs> he meets the owner. So spoiler. Yeah. Um, but we were lucky enough to work in the Steven Spielberg and roto animating horses right, yeah. <laughs> and doing cameras but can you imagine for a yeah. junior yeah. right now you have to animate a quadruped <laughs> yeah yeah i've actually never <laughs> wrote a quadruped. Yeah, a quadruped oh, it's hard, yeah yeah <laughs> so now this is someone that is in my department that i actually yeah. worked with uh, yeah because he's prince i worked with him briefly on a marvel film uh, oh, nice. on a sequence that is probably not going to be in the film because the cut it. Well. Oh no. Possibly. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I don't you, know. It might come back. You're not allowed to. Yeah, of course. I can't say either way. But yeah. Like, I, I don't know. But we did work together briefly, and yeah. um, he's he's really cool. He's a really cool guy. 
Uh, yeah. Obviously, he's worked on a lot of big films, um, mm -hmm. and that was yeah, that was the first Marvel film I worked on. This was definitely not his his kind of life. Oh yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, yeah. So tell us a bit about Prince and how you got in touch with him. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, firstly, I wish I wish I had you on for this episode because this is your your department, and <laughs> I know I wasn't as um as technical for this episode. It was it's quite surface based um but that's because it's not my department and <laughs> i don't know much about um 2d and and compositions so but yeah hopefully next time or hopefully i can interview you next time um but yeah prince prince was went to the same university in a different he did um post-production i think um and um his journey he's been he's been he started off actually before we finished university prince had been working in the industry like for about a year or so um in the industry whilst we were at university and it was pretty cool because he was one of the few people that were doing it and and earning from working in his industry and and gaining experience while still studying and you really um, want to listen to what he says about this because i think you really want to be doing that i think mm -hmm. you're very interested in it. if you're going to university yeah. apart from the money actually just yeah. having experience and mm -hmm. having a degree it's like normally it's like one or the other and if if someone is doing both then yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah he did that he he was freelancing as well um he freelanced a few times at glassworks when i was there um I don't know if you did. You, did you ever use flame or, or smoke? Uh, so I use flame actually as a review tool. So because okay. I, I, nuke, it, its big weakness is playback, right? It's it's not yeah. the best at playback. So yeah. um, flame is great for a review suite. Um, mm -hmm. And if you can, you can actually comp live with people in there. And I think the big thing about flame isn't so much the software; it's more, it's more the the, the flame artist role of sitting with clients and mm -hmm. having those skills. Mm -hmm. um but yeah so i've done things with it but I can't yeah no not really like I, uh, I, yeah. I, I know some flame artists and, and it's it's, yeah. it's pretty it's pretty awesome I, I guess nuke is focused on everything being physically accurate very precise mm -hmm. but maximum bit depth and flame kind of compromises on some of that stuff but in order to keep it fast mm -hmm. so that you can you know change things while while you're working yeah so it's almost a bit like in 3d like unreal versus arnold or something you know? yeah sure yeah 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 but yeah the reason i asked was because yeah prince prince was very keen on set on becoming like a flame um operator um because at the time he he saw that as as his his um his career path or his his destiny <laughs> to be a frame <laughs> a frame up um but i think yeah whilst he he was growing through the industry he realized it couldn't have been possible um and then so he yeah he, through his journey he 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 changed minds and he went back even though he had experience as a as a compositor or like rotor prep um artist he went back to being uh, a runner at frame store and then that started his his journey at frame store which he's been there for about seven years or so and he's he's yeah. moved on He's, yeah, he just. I think he, I was on the last show that he worked on, and now mm -hmm. he's like leaving. Thing. So, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of uh, that's a cool one. So mm. check that out. Um, let's hear a bit of Prince now. Yeah. So when I was, I've always had like this thing of I, I just didn't want to like the fear of failure. Kind of always yeah. pushed me to to kind of look for work or look for a. Yeah. Uh, jobs or whatever, even before we had finished uni, when we was in yeah. Ravensbourne. Yeah. And um, I, I kind of quickly realised when I was in uni that, oh, I, unless I have some sort of experience and can understand and know the industry before I leave, mm -hmm. um, it will be much harder or more difficult for me to get a job. I was fortunate that my parents trusted me mm. uh, and they've always kind of trusted me to make like a right decision. And when you're growing up, especially like when you come from where we're from you hear that oh, what are you doing and yeah yeah like, yeah what you're not going to come out of uni and get a job look at this yeah. person who studied this they yeah. didn't get a job and so i was like look there's no way i'm going to be one of those people who leave uni and don't yeah. don't do what they studied three four years yeah of, of their life for not that there's you know people go on and do other things but for me personally i wanted to do this and 
I was like, I need to do everything that I can now yeah. to kind of get your head start. Cool. And now everyone wants to be on set, right? Like, or at least yeah. they think they want to be on set. Maybe when they do it, they hate it. I wanted, like... I wanted to be on set. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got on set supervising with Rory Bryant's uh, yeah. NPC. So, and he was on like the Lion King. Uh, yeah. So we've got some, like, not just like some little things. Like yeah. Things. No, yeah. Yeah, Lion, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Rory's been on quite a few really cool films um, and his, his what he does allows him to, to travel around the world um, and he carries a big, um, a lot of responsibility because he has to get all of the data that is needed back in the studios, like the camera data, metadata, lighting references and sometimes textures and whatnot so he carries a lot of resp- responsibility um as well as being away from family for many periods of, t- of 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 time um which is a, quite a, a difficult industry especially if you have you have a family for example it's difficult to be away for long periods of time but he he just he just does it seamlessly he just loves it and it was interesting to find out about his journey to to Africa and like how they filmed, how they filmed, and how he gathered the information for for Lion King. And yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I was literally just reminiscing because I yeah, I wanted to I wanted to be on set. I wanted to travel based on inspiration from initially I, like I, I wanted to be like a photographer for National Geographic because I love traveling and I just wanted to be somewhere remote and just be taking photos of something amazing and because actually that... your photography is really good if, if you're not following Kofi on Instagram then you should think ah, thank so. you. I, I actually checked it out and I think you were saying earlier I don't know why Yuri followed me but I, I think yeah. I know why like <laughs> it's uh, really yeah. good so you know who knows you might be doing that I'm going to turn on the light it's getting dark yeah yeah but yeah yeah so yeah Rory's, Rory's episode is, is really cool um and it's yeah, it's interesting because after after his episode came out, I I had um someone from um Tunisia uh, message me and said oh he he'd been in touch with with Rory because he he is looking to get into on set experience and and yeah he found that episode to be very um helpful so cool. it's quite let's, cool yeah let's hear a bit the um I went all over India for the Jungle Book. Yeah, I was there for about a month, okay. um, which was really cool. We sort of travelled around and sort of trekked through forests and like clambered up waterfalls and yeah. and stuff like that, which was really cool. Yeah, um, taking lots of um, reference uh, textures and round shots, and photogrammetry yeah. and HDRIs and all kinds of yeah. all that good stuff. Yeah, um, because obviously the artists back at NPC then along with you know just their artistic flair yeah. and stuff they 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 that helped sort of yeah inform and uh, the environment builds and stuff like that yeah, sure, yeah. Book. yeah. um kenya for for yeah. the lion king mm. was pretty special we were there for yeah. like five six weeks and that was yeah. that was pretty epic and we had a great team like yeah. it was awesome it was so yeah. much fun um yeah that, that was really cool mm. sort of helicopter look that was kind of like the most helicopter work i'd ever done oh. in one stint yeah. experience is great mm. but i think like that sort of overall like connection at the beginning is like quite important so mm-hmm. being able to talk yeah. to the person is, is really good and hold like a, a pretty mm-hmm. solid conversation with them like I, I like to think the interviews that i conduct are fairly like laid back in a sense because mm-hmm. i kind of want to get to know the person right yeah. i want to know know a little bit about them see how see the way they tick because they have we have to be confident about sending them yeah. away possibly by themselves mm-hmm to spend two or three months with our clients and and and, and stuff like that so mm-hmm. um that that's the sort of um i guess the um not the main thing but the subconscious thing i kind of i, I kind of look for and then and then obviously experience is great so mm-hmm. th- that comes in two two forms basically you have yeah. the visual effects artist um experience and then you have the onset experience mm-hmm. Not everybody needs both, of course. Like it's, it's ideally they would have both. You know, even if it's just a little bit of one and a little bit of the other, it's great because you've had a taste of each one. Um, but then, if if it's more your visual effects artist, but you want to start going on set, mm-hmm. um, then that's great because you already have that sort of um, the idea 
you have the the the, the, the visual effects pipeline sort of mm -hmm. always in the yeah. back of your head when you're yeah. doing this stuff when you're doing the work yeah. you're, you're always thinking about how is this in going to integrate mm -hmm. um but for those kind of people if they haven't been on set before then i would make sure they had like strong camera knowledge they they know about you know production cinema cameras lenses mm -hmm. distortion uh, mm -hmm. and, and all those sort of varying factors within camera sure. as well as being able to use cameras as well because like you said a lot of our work is photography so yeah. they need to be a pretty comfortable yeah. photographer to be able yeah. to like quickly change settings for mm -hmm. and, and, and the right settings for what okay. we're trying to capture at the time because you yeah. know it can be t quite time yeah. sensitive mm -hmm. and then the on set side if you've got more on set experience again that's great because we don't really have to teach those sort of on set soft skills mm -hmm. you've probably already seen an hd right rig you've probably already seen a lidar you've probably already seen this stuff whether you've used it or not Mm -hmm. is one thing but as long as you've seen it and you've seen people use it um and then you can always sort of mold and teach the the sort of vfx pipeline side you know we could be like hey this is blah 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 from assets let's chat to them about you know what's the most important thing to get here's yeah. you know marco from environments let's mm -hmm. like let's talk to him about what he's going to need you know and slowly over time it starts like building up their confidence and their knowledge of, mm -hmm. of the vfx pipeline um yeah. so yeah i think they're they're the kind of like three main sort of candidates we get okay you know people with both mm -hmm. vfx artists or yeah. on set so yeah if you're looking to get on set that you want to listen to this and get some get some tips yeah um which actually uh, just to sort of take a break from like you know going through the episodes i just wanted yeah. to ask you what do you think you've learned from doing this podcast like from being like obviously people listening are learning from mm -hmm. it but you're doing the interviews learning stuff right mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah i i was thinking about it the other day um and i'm trying to pick it back up um let me have it let me have a think um you put me on the spot <laughs> <laughs> You put me on the spot. Um, what did I? What have I picked up from this? We can go to commercials. No, we can't. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have commercials. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess every. I mean, they all seem to be quite similar in 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 a way that everyone's had to start from 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 somewhere. Everyone has had to start off from not knowing. Um, much about the department that they are in or have transitioned into um and it takes a lot of of like learning and and being um open to 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 making mistakes and and just l like literally um what's the word just literally taking on everything and just just sacrificing a lot of time and 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 um just yeah learning and just literally just focusing on on what you wanted to and then just putting in time and eventually yeah you get to do it or you're you're rewarded for for your support sacrifice not sacrifices <laughs> but, <laughs> your time. but your commitment right yeah like, commitment that's the not, word not, yeah not backing down and just like <laughs> yeah and I, I think yeah it, you can always get somewhere like um, you might not necessarily get even where you want to be, but you'll get mm -hmm. somewhere, and like that yeah. might be a really cool place. It might be better than where you want it to be. Right? Yeah. Like, it might be somewhere more interesting yeah. or just a little bit different. I mean, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's the story that we've seen with a lot of these people, right? That they've yeah. maybe thought they wanted to do one thing, but then they've actually ended up doing something really cool, mm -hmm. even if it isn't the thing they originally thought they were going to do. Yeah. But yeah. someone who um, did something really cool, like for sure, is uh, Yolanda. Mm. So this is so we've got you've got an actress. She's she's one of the widows in Black Widow. So you know yeah. the lines. Yeah, Yolanda. So yeah, how Yolanda. did you meet up with uh, a Black Widow? Yeah, no, <laughs> or, no, no Yolanda. I've known Yolanda for some time. We're like we're we're good friends, and um, um, so she <laughs> she before before um, Black Widow came out. I mean, when she was allowed to sort of post on social media that she was going to be in the film. Um, yeah, she'd been sharing a bit on her, on her social media, and it was quite cool um, to bring her on because her. I wanted to get her to tell us a bit more about how she became an actress and how people can be become actresses or or 
actors and Black Widow was quite a big film because it came out at, at a time where a lot of films had been postponed because of the pandemic mm-hmm. and um, yet yeah, it was um, like uh, things were opening up and people were starting to go to the cinema so it was a big deal and it was um, quite interesting to yeah just to learn about how she got her role and what she had to do or yeah to do to to get her role as a widow in the film so let's hear a bit of Yolanda um so many amazing girls in one room Mm. it was really inspiring to see Mm. so much talent in one room and Mm -hmm. like so much girl power in one room I think it was like my favorite day yeah at the time, it was the best day of my life because yeah. I was like, this is so exciting. Mm-hmm. And we got to do the script again with the director, Kate Shortland, who's amazing. And uh, yeah, read uh, some dialogue with her. And then there was a dance audition. Um, and then there was a little fight scene audition. Yeah. Um, which uh, it was James Young who was doing like teaching us choreo and then um, we'd have to then perform the little fight scene that we'd learned and then did some pad work um, with Troy um, a guy he he's amazing with weapons and guns um, mm. Troy Milanov mm. so we did pad work with him and then I got asked to do some wire work and that was yeah when I got asked to do the, the actual, the movement of coming down through the ceiling. Yeah. If you want to be an actress or an actor, then um, definitely check that out. Um, that's episode nine. And we're yeah. into episode 10. So we're like, oh, for that. And I've not even got involved. So just so you guys know, <laughs> like all of this was done by Kofi on his own completely. Um, and I yeah. joined, um, the first episode I was episode 14 so we're nearly at the episode that I did and then it's going to swap around and Kofi's yeah. going to be asking me questions but um yeah but just so just while we get there uh we're on episode 10 um yep. so yeah you've been doing this for how long now like like how how often were you doing these episodes when you were doing it all on your own um maybe I was I was scheduling episodes for maybe every two weeks uh, um, as, as, as fast as I could yeah. I could um, arrange them so I had them back to back so initially when I started the episode I had the intention of recording at least four or five episodes before I launched just so that I have I have content to keep posting so I had like four four or five episodes recorded and then yeah I started launching them oh cool so yeah, yeah. that's why you were so, saying but yeah that you you recorded um, Aces one in February, and then of course you yeah. recorded all the other ones, and then put them all out. Mm-hmm.